glad you didn't leave me to walk past the roses because I've got a very unhappy unha side called my left side and I can't judge distance. I knock things over. Sorry. Our first reading is taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 10, uh, verses 1 to 18. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, Anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him, because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him, because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He settles me down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He brings me back and causes me to repent. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love 
will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to ask Dean to come and uh, bring the sermon for us this morning. I'm just going to pray for him at the beginning of this time. Lord, I do thank you for Dean. I thank you for this word that he's prepared. I pray, Lord, that you will prepare our hearts, Lord, that they will be good soil for your word today. And we pray, Lord, that you will speak by your spirit through the words that Dean has prepared to each one of us as we come to receive from you today, feasting on your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the, the fourth and the final sermon on the Good Shepherd, and it is where we reach our climax in this series. Um, just feeling like a long time, and I hope you kind of got things out of it. I, I've enjoyed reading um, the book from this, and, um, and as I said before, the idea of the Lord as the shepherd has really always struck me, partly because I felt like the, the lost sheep many of the times. Okay, so the first point... It's about recognizing the shepherd's voice. So picture, if you will, the following scene. It's morning in the village. Each household has a small herd of sheep. And so they employ a young boy to be their shepherd for the whole village. It would be more economical that way. So each morning, the young shepherd travels to each of the villagers. And what does he do? The good shepherd inevitably calls at each home knocks on the door and calls out the owner's name. Now, knocking on the door and not calling out would mean that the person seeking entrance is a stranger. It would frighten the members of the family. But good morning, everyone. Hey, David, it's Josiah. I'm ready to go. Would guarantee a quick open door. But now the shepherd has a problem. How does he get the sheep out of the house or enclosed walled pen? Now, some of you, we tend to pick this up in the nativity and the manger. So some people didn't have particularly that many sheep. And the house was such that they, it was kind of built into, well, basically it was two levels. So the family would live on the sort of upper level. And there would be sort of where the the manger-ish area would be where the sheep were. But some people had that. If you're a little bit prosperous, you'd have a walled pen. But a lot of people would have sheep within their house, as it were. So how does the shepherd get the sheep out of the house or the walled pen? Well, this isn't really a problem for this good shepherd, or for any shepherd for that matter, because the sheep know his voice. He stands outside the house or pen, and he gives his own unique call which is a short five to 10 second chant or song. The sheep know his voice. That is, like the timber, I think that's the right way of saying it, of his voice. This timber is more important um, to the flock than the tune sung by him. A stranger could say the same words and sing the same song and they would not recognize him. Thus they wouldn't follow him. In fact, verse 5 says, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. So what about us? Do you recognize the good shepherd's voice? When a villager gets a new sheep, perhaps from a neighboring village, the new sheep doesn't recognize the shepherd's voice. They haven't learned to know his voice or indeed trust the shepherd yet. This takes time. And this is the same for us also in our relationship with Jesus. It takes time for us to recognize the timber of Jesus' voice and to learn to trust him. What I'd just like you to do for a couple of minutes, and I did something like this last session, um, but the person next to you, ask them this question. Do you recognize the voice of Jesus in your own life? How did you learn to recognize his voice? 
and was it easy? So share with each other, I'm just going to give you one or two minutes. Do you recognize the voice of Jesus and how do you recognize it in your life? Off you go. <laughs> Okay, just drawing that together. I'm glad you've been to... <laughs> Do you recognize the voice of Jesus in your own life? Is it easy? I can remember when I first became a Christian, and um, you know, people used to talk about you know, trying to listen to, to Jesus' voice. And, um, and I've probably told you this before. I used to pray, God, you're going to have to speak up. Don't do the whispering stuff, because that just simply is not going to work, okay? Anything subtle, it has got to be a little bit more kind of vocal. And I think he kind of does that in the early stages. Uh, and then sometimes his voice gets a bit quieter sort of later on as he kind of draws us into it. But, yeah, I think sometimes I think you need to have prayers like that. You know, the message version of the Bible, as you know, not everyone likes it, but I do like its forthrightness. And I, and I find that very appealing. It doesn't pull its punches, which I like as well. And, and I think sometimes, you know, I think we have a God who actually likes us to talk straight. I think he likes us to, to spend time with him and speak to him. He's not going to be, he knows what's in our heart anyway. It's no secret to him. So you might as well tell him. That has kind of always been sort of my motto. And, um, you know, and God is, loves us. We are precious and he wants to spend time with us. There are no shortcuts here to recognizing our Savior's voice. But Christianity is not much, is not such, a, Christianity isn't so much a religion, it is a relationship with a person. And I think that really distinguishes Christianity. I mean, people often talk about you know, our religion. Well, a religion's more like an idea. But we don't have an idea. We have a person, and his name is Jesus. And all meaningful relationships take time and effort. There's lots of married couples here. I don't know how quickly your relationship sort of developed. And in terms of friends and relations, whoever it might be, work colleagues, meaningful relationships take time, and they take effort to develop but we can be confident that we really do have a heavenly father who wants to speak to us. And I think he speaks primarily for the Bible, as we'll talk about later on, but I think he speaks through other ways as well. And again, this is not in my notes, but Habakkuk, and this has always kind of str struck me, um, is about a prophet who asks God questions. And I would encourage you to ask God questions. Throw them to him, as it were. Lift them up to you. You might be surprised with the results. I think he speaks sometimes not in way answers in ways that we don't really expect. But he is a God who speaks. And he speaks through his word and he speaks through Jesus and his spirit. Primarily, we learn about Jesus and our Heavenly Father through spending time in the Bible. And Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing, 
and hearing through the word of Christ. If we don't spend time in the word of Christ, we will find it difficult to hear him in our own lives. And I would say, and I know that there are other people in Christ Church who believe this and know this also in their lives, that Christians often miss out so much by not spending time reading their Bibles. Ultimately, when we fail to do this, we are missing out on one of the biggest blessings we can ever receive, and that is knowing Jesus. The Bible is not like any other book. It is the Word of God, and it talks continuously about Jesus. Now, we may know about Jesus through the Spirit, but we find out who he is through his Word. If you want to know who Jesus is, open your Bibles. Question, are you missing out on knowing and discovering Jesus for yourself? Or are you only relying on hearing him when you come to church? Do you only hear experiences of Jesus in other people's lives? Would you like to have your own experience of Jesus? You can have them also if you want to. It's a little bit of application here. Um, there'll be some slides that kind of uh, accompany this. Um, if you don't spend much time in your Bible and you want to start building a healthy habit, just use some soap. Now, I have stolen this from somebody else, um, and that person will be laughing when they hear the, the tape later on. But soap stands for scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Some people might, this is a form of lecta divina, but it's kind of a bit more sort of um, simpler, if that's such a word. <laughs> so number one, start with some scripture. Perhaps start with reading the Gospels, Matthew. If you want to find out how Jesus is, start from the Gospel. It does start off with his, in the genealogy, so you might want to get through that a little bit quickly, but although that is worth kind of spending time in. I'd recommend reading a small section up to perhaps the next heading. If you look at your Bible, often they're in headings. Why don't, you know, don't, don't read too much to start with. Read a paragraph or a section. Take about five minutes to start with and see what happens. And it is about a habit, so it's about kind of when are you going to do that? And my, another vicar from a different place used to say we have to be intentional about this. Otherwise, it simply will not happen. Often we say, well, that's a good idea. Well, look how many good ideas we've had and not kind of done anything with. If you want to discover Jesus for yourself and hear him speak, when are you going to spend time in his word? Now, some people do that in the morning, where it fits with you. Okay, there's no, I would say, magic formula. You know, decide. And don't read too much. As you've read it, the next one is observation. I should look up there. Uh, what do you notice? Place yourself in the scene. What do you see or hear, smell or even feel? Often Lexa Davina often said, place yourself. And actually the Gospels, I think, are quite good at this because they're kind of, I'd say the rest of the Bible isn't. But there's some really good encounters there. Place yourself on as a character or someone who's watching. The next one is application. What specific situation in your life relates to this passage? What is God's personal invitation for you from this scripture? Sometimes there may not be application. In number four, prayer. You may just want to give thanks to what it says. Give thanks to, for what you've learned from the passage about who God is and what is like. And if nothing else, if you praised and prayed about that paragraph, I think things will come out of that, praising God for who he is, what he's done. Perhaps invite your Heavenly Father into the points you've identified in, in the application. Remember that Jesus does not leave us on our own. 
John 14, 15 to 18 says, If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you, give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now there's a promise. I will come to you. Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit to help us get to know him. And that's why praying before and after reading the Bible is so important. He will give you another counsellor to be with you forever. He is inside us. When you invite Jesus into your life, he gives you the Holy Spirit. He's there already in you. In fact, some of you, and probably a lot of you, already know what it's like to have him inside you. The way he speaks to you already. I think that's part of his voice. How much does, how much does the good shepherd love you? Returning to the little story I started the sermon with, the shepherd boy knocks on the village's door and greets the owner of the sheep. And the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice and they come out and follow him. So verse four and five. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his, all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Don't you think that piece of scripture is amazing? The shepherd knows his sheep's name. This isn't some casual relationship or a hired man looking out uh, for some sheep just for the money and will flee when a little bit of trouble comes along. No, the good shepherd is not like this. He knows his sheep and his sheep knows each one by name. Who is this good shepherd? Twice Jesus affirms in this scripture that he is the good shepherd. Verse 11 and verse 14. I am the good shepherd. Question. Did you know that you are known by name by Jesus? Do you know that? He is the good shepherd. You are the sheep of his pasture, and he is calling you by name. Can you hear him calling? He, verse 3, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him. Are you following him? is calling you, and it's calling you by name. Just like that 1980s pop group, he really is a personal Jesus, but probably not quite as they envisaged. How much does the good shepherd love us? Verse six, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the, tr for the sheep. What does this mean? Sometimes shepherds have to travel long distances to find pasture and grass for the sheep to eat. This sometimes means that they have to stay out all night in the open country. In the wilderness, there are often round, rough built enclosures built by shepherds over hundreds of years. And these enclosures have no roof or door. So the shepherd becomes the gate or some translation, the door. Verse nine, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. So what is the significance of the shepherd as the gate stroke door? Well, the significance becomes apparent when danger comes in the guise of a thief or a wolf. 
Jesus is showing us that the shepherd is the one way into, into salvation. And verse 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they, that you may have life and have it to the full. The thief's interest is in himself. Christ's is in his sheep. And that is you and me. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The higher hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Reading between the lines of this parable is a battle between the wolf and the good shepherd in which the shepherd does indeed lose his own life. When Jesus calls himself the good shepherd in this parable, he is pointing to his own death for the sake of his own sheep, the sheep of his pasture that he knows each by name. Like the parable, Jesus has a choice whether or not to lay down his own life for his sheep. Again, verse 18, which I think is quite a striking verse. No one, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it back up. Jesus didn't have to die for us. He had the authority to do so or not. He laid, he chose to lay his life down for us. drawing the, the, the sermon to the end do you want to know how much our Lord Jesus loves you it is enough to die for to die for you Christ Church is loved by God we are the sheep of his pasture he laid down his life for every single one of us. He is calling us. He is calling us to follow him. Yes, we have probably strayed. Perhaps we've even lost our own way on this journey of ours. Yes, we are also hurt and wounded. But returning to Psalm 23, he is, res he is waiting to restore our soul. He is calling us to repent for losing our way. He wants to guide us back in paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake, we are his sheep. We belong to him. It's his reputation that's on stake here, actually. And that's why I kind of spoke to him about Psalm 1. A shepherd who loses his sheep He's a bit of a dodgy shepherd. That's why they went after them, their, their reputation. Jesus will come after us for his name's sake. And even though we are walking through the valley of darkness and trial, he is with us, as Psalm 23 says. He is our good shepherd. Christchurch, our journey does not end here in the valley of darkness and in our trials. Surely goodness and love will follow us all the days of our lives and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are his sheep, the sheep of his pasture. His reputation is at stake. But we need to bleat if we are to be found. And if we keep quiet, he won't find us. That is the parable of, um, sorry, the Psalm 23. Are we bleating? Do we want to be found? To dwell means to be invited to live with God as his guest and his family. He is our Heavenly Father 
and we are his sons and daughters in Christ Church. Christ Church, we are being called by our good shepherd. We're being called to follow him. Are we listening? Amen. Can we just have me on slightly hijack this, if I may? I'm not very sure where this is going. I'm just going to invite, um, if you'd like to stand, I think it'd be quite good just to wait for this moment um, and let's see what the Lord and his spirit has in mind. Um, you don't have to stand up if you don't wish to, but it, sometimes it just puts us in a, in a place of wanting to receive. Let's just see what happens. So I just invite you to stand if you wish. And if you put your hands out, it's just kind of, it's kind of ready in our hearts to be open to the Lord. So we pray, come Holy Spirit. We ask, come Jesus, our good shepherd. As in your mind, you might want to say that, invite him in. Come Lord Jesus. wait on the Lord and you may just want to just invite him, encourage him, welcome him in your heart. feel like you're lost, why don't you just call him and say you want to be found, invite him. Lord, we pray that you may see, we pray that we'd be found, Lord, may you come. We praise you, Lord, that you are the good shepherd. Everyone can be found who wants, who wants to be. You're a good shepherd who searches for us. Praise you, Father God. And Lord, we pray for our hearts, Lord, that they may be open to you, Lord hearts may be opened to your spirit, to your calling. And so Lord, we ask that you may speak in, speak in ways that we can hear. Help us to recognize your voice, learn to recognize and trust you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you help us to help us to understand and spend time in your word. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word, that we would get to know you and our Heavenly Father. pray, Lord, that we would be hungry for your word. And that's what we pray, Lord. We pray, Holy Spirit, create within us a hunger and a thirst for your word, for your presence, for your name. And 
And Lord, we pray for when the sheep are, when we're hurt, a little bit broken, Lord. We pray that you may come and gather us up in your arms, Lord. You're going to carry us back. That's what the good shepherd does. He carries the lost sheep in his arms. And so we pray, Father, that you would bring healing where we are hurt and are broken. And we ask that you may restore us. So we pray, come Holy Spirit, have your way within us. Please sit down. Um, uh, thank you, Dean. For